This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 2007, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2007. We also look at the case for putting the group Chic into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Walk of Fame is the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood, California. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2007. In the music events for 2007, the music industry went through some growing pains of the digital revolution as digital downloads went up, but album sales cratered. The Live Earth concerts were held in 12 different stadiums and seven continents. The concert for Diana, honoring the memory of British Princess Diana, took place that year. Justin Bieber started his road to getting discovered when he started his YouTube channel. Old school soul music made a comeback with artists like Amy Winehouse fully embracing and paying homage to it. Radiohead released an album and then told people to pay whatever they wanted for it. Most people gave the band money for it instead of taking a free album. Prince gave away his album Planet Earth for free with purchase of the British Daily Mail tabloid. Speaking of Prince, he also performed the halftime show at the Super Bowl that year, which is still considered by many to be the greatest Super Bowl performance of all time. Jordan Sparks won American Idol. Speaking of American Idol, the best-selling album that year was American Idol alumni Chris Daughtry's first album. Also among the more popular albums and artists that year were Beyonce, Kanye, Taylor Swift's debut album, Jay-Z's American Gangster, Linkin Park, another American Idol alumni, Carrie Underwood, Justin Timberlake, Gwen Stefani, Nickelback, the Hannah Montana soundtrack, and the High School Musical 2 soundtrack. Daughtry outsold all of those. Seriously. Such was the power of American Idol back in the day. Worldwide, though, Daughtry was no match for Avril Lavigne's album, The Best Damn Thing, which was the biggest-selling album of the year worldwide. The most critically acclaimed album of the year, though, was Amy Winehouse's 2006 album, Back in Black, while her song Rehab was the most critically acclaimed song of the year. The top single of the year was Irreplaceable by Beyoncé. Other top singles were Rihanna and Jay-Z with Umbrella, Gwen Stefani and Akon with The Sweet Escape, Fergie with Big Girls Don't Cry, T-Pain and Young Jock with Buy You a Drink, Carrie Underwood with Before He Cheats, Plain White Tees with Hey There Delilah, Akon and Snoop Dogg with I Wanna Love You, Nelly Furtado with Say It Right, Fergie and Ludacris with Glamorous, MIA's iconic Paper Planes, and Akon with Don't Matter. Akon had a really big year that year. In country music, singer Sammy Kershaw ran for Louisiana Lieutenant Governor. He, I believe, lost. Rascal Flatts, Sugarland, Brooks and Dunn, Montgomery Gentry, Big and Rich, and Emerson Drive were the biggest groups that year. Top artists included Rodney Atkins, Kenny Chesney, Tim McGraw, Taylor Swift, Carrie Underwood, Brad Paisley, Billy Currington, Reba McIntyre, Martina McBride, Allison Krauss, George Strait, Keith Urban, Kelly Pickler, and Luke Bryan. There were 25 singles that hit the top of the country singles chart that year. Among them were Kenny Chesney's Beer in Mexico, Never Wanted Nothing More, and also Don't Blink. So he had three of those 25. Taylor Swift's Our Song also made the cut, along with Garth Brooks's More Than a Memory, Tim McGraw's Last Dollar, Brad Paisley's Online, also his song She's Everything, and also his song Ticks, which is a really strange song thing to sing about. But it worked. Went to number one. 
Rascal Flats also had Stand and Take Me There. Big and Rich, Lost in This Moment, made the cut, along with George Strait's It Just Comes Natural and Carrie Underwood's So Small and Wasted. In hip-hop, the biggest albums of the year were done by Kanye, 50 Cent, T.I., Jay-Z, Fabulous, Common, UGK, Lupe Fiasco, Young Buck, Red Man, J. Dilla, LP, DJ Khaled, Cassidy, Jeezy, Fat Joe, Play a Circle, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Dizzy Rascal, Sage Francis, Ghostface Killer, and Timberland. The top singles were Kanye's Stronger, along with Good Life, Timberland's Give It to Me, 50 Cent and Justin Timberlake's AO Technology, Bone Thugs and Harmonies, I Tried, Fabulous's Make Me Better, T.I.'s Big Things Poppin', Fat Joe's Make It Rain, Play of Circles, Duffel Bag Boy, and Jeezy's Go Getta. In dance music, some of the biggest clubs on the party island of Ibiza were shut down by the cops for not doing a good enough job of getting the illegal drug trade out of their clubs. Some of the big albums included Justice's Cross album, Burials Untrue, Calvin Harris's I Invented Disco, and Groove Armadas. Pop and R&B artists like Madonna, Justin Timberlake, Nelly Furtado, and Rihanna continued to dominate the dance charts. However, some EDM artists managed to break through, like Bob Sinclair, who, along with Big Ali and Dollar Man, scored a huge club hit with Rock This Party. Ed Prince's song, Proper Education, became the first remix of an original song to get onto Billboard's Top Dance Airplay chart. That original song, by the way, was Another Brick in the Wall from Pink Floyd. Ralph Falcon's song, I Need Someone, was the biggest hit on the Dance Club play chart. Mindless Self-Indulgence also had a couple of major club hits, Straight to Video and Shut Me Up. September's Cry for You, David Guetta's Love Don't Let Me Go, Cascada's Every Time We Touch, and also the song Miracle. Edom's Put em Up, Ida Kors, Let Me Think About It. Chris Lake's Changes, Justice's D-A-N-C-E, along with their songs by Basement Jacks, Armin Van Helden, Ferry Corson, Axwell, Daft Punk, Proxy, ATB, The Chemical Brothers, Eric Pritz again, Calvin Harris, and Sneaky Sound System were also huge that year. The top 10 DJs on DJ Mag's Top 100 DJs poll were Armin Van Buren, Tiesto, John Digweed, Paul Van Dyke, Sasha, Above and Beyond, Carl Cox, Ferry Corston, Infected Mushroom, and David Guetta. The top Latin artists of 2007 included RBD, who had the top album, Aventura, who had the second biggest album and also the top single, Daddy Yankee, Mana. Valentin Elizande, Vicente Fernandez, Jennifer Lopez, Don Omar, Wizen E. Yandel, Ricky Martin, Enrique Iglesias, and Hector El Fater. Musicals that opened on Broadway included Legally Blonde, Curtains, and the revival of 110 in the Shade. Musical films that were popular in 2007 included the remake of the 1988 movie Hairspray, along with Across the Universe, which remade music from the Beatles, Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street, based on the Broadway musical, and Once. The TV musical High School Musical 2 also came out in 2007, breaking television ratings for the Disney Channel, which broadcasted the musical. Bands that started in 2007 included Bass Invaders, ASAP Mob, Mumford & Sons, Blood on the Dance Floor, Florence and the Machine, Haim, Cruella, Versailles, WNW, and Tame Impala. Chris Cornell left Audio Slave that year. Other groups that broke through before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus included Audio Slave, Evanescence, Outcast, Train, Flowetry, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, The Lords of the New Church, Body Rockers, Jurassic Five, Junior Mafia, Quiet Riot, New Order, and Genesis. 
bands that reformed in 2007 included Extreme, The Jesus and Mary Chain, Boy Zone, The Blow Monkeys, Sixpence None the Richer, Soul to Soul, Squeeze, King Crimson, James, EMF, Eve Six, The Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, Oblivion, Van Halen with David Lee Roth back as lead singer, and N17. Bands that reformed in 2007 for either one tour or one performance only included The Police, The Spice Girls, and Led Zeppelin, with Jason Bonham taking over drumming duties for his late father, John Bonham. Artists who were born in 2007 included singer Lil Tay, singer Melody, and singer and rapper Alea Lai. Artists who unfortunately passed away in 2007 included R&B pioneer Ike Turner, singer Dan Fogelberg, country great Porter Wagner, Bill Pinckney of The Drifters, Kevin Debro of Quiet Riot, jazz pianist Oscar Peterson, jazz saxophonist Michael Brecker, Mark St. John of Kiss, Brad Delp of Boston, Zola Taylor of The Platters, Hank Medress of The Tokens, George McCorkle of the Marshall Tucker Band, jazz musician Alice Coltrane, Denny Doherty of the Mamas and the Papas, singer Frankie Lane, Indonesian singer Chris Yee, entertainer Kitty Carlisle, cellist Mitislav Rostopovich, Izumi Sakai of the group Zard, a Hawaiian entertainer extraordinaire, Mr. Tiny Bubbles himself, Mr. Don Ho, Tony Thompson of High Five, not to be confused with Tony Thompson of Chic. Ian Wallace of King Crimson. Billy Henderson of The Spinners. Joe Hunter of Motown Records House Band, The Funk Brothers. Bam Bam Lane of Bill Haley and His Comets. Mexican singer Antonio Aguilar. Reggae artist Lucky Doobie. Entertainer and entrepreneur Mr. Merv Griffin. Ooh. That was his catchphrase. Paul Raven of Killing Joke, entertainer Robert Goulet, Carter Albrecht of Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians, Joe Zeranol of Weather Report, saxophonist Boots Randolph, opera singers Luciano Pavarotti, Beverly Sills, and Regine Crespin, singer Greth Kausland, composer Carl Heinz Stockhausen, Macedonian singer Tose Proeski, Polish musician Witold Kieltika, singer and actress Carol Bruce, singer-songwriter Lee Hazelwood, composer Giancarlo Menotti, and jazz percussionist Max Roach. In award ceremonies for the music of 2007, Kanye was the most nominated at the Grammy Awards with 10 awards. However, Amy Winehouse was the big winner of the night, winning five awards, including Record and Song of the Year for the song Rehab, along with Best New Artist, beating out Taylor Swift for Best New Artist. Because of visa problems getting into the United States because of prior legal problems in the United Kingdom, Amy was not allowed to enter the United States to attend the ceremony. Instead, she performed and accepted her awards via satellite back in England. Jazz great Herbie Hancock won Album of the Year for River, the Joni Mitchell Letters. At the American Music Awards, Rihanna, Daughtry, Beyonce, and Carrie Underwood were the big winners. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Rihanna and Jay-Z won Video of the Year for Umbrella. The Police, Rihanna, Justin Timberlake, Daughtry, Gwen Stefani all won the music categories at the People's Choice Awards. The Billboard Music Awards were not actually given between the years 2007 and 2010. And the Soul Train Music Awards were also canceled, but would return the next year. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Helsinki, Finland, Marja Serafovic from Serbia won for the song Molitva. Kenny Chesney won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and he also won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. The Arctic Monkeys won Best British Album for Favorite Worst Nightmare, and Take That won Best Song for Shine at the Brit Awards. Feist won Best Album for The Reminder, while they also won Best Song for 1, 2, 3, 4, and they also won Artist of the Year at the Juno Awards. Silverchair won Album of the Year for Young Modern, and they also won Single of the Year for Straight Lines at the Aria Music Awards. 
At the Tony Awards, Spring Awakening won Best Musical and Company won Best Revival of a Musical. Musically at the Academy Awards, Glenn Hansard and Marquetta Irglova won Best Original Film Song for Falling Slowly from the Movie Once. Meanwhile, Dario Marianelli won Best Original Film Score for the Movie Atonement. The Pulitzer Prize in Music went to Ornette Coleman for Sound Grammar. The Canadian Polaris Prize went to Patrick Watson for his album Close to Paradise. George Shearing was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. Evelyn Glennie was made a dame, while Rod Stewart, John Rutter, and Imogen Cooper were among those given the Order of British Empire Awards by the Queen. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on March 12th of that year at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. During the ceremony, only Sammy Hagar and Mike Lanthony from Van Halen went to the ceremony to be inducted, despite the fact that they both had been kicked out of the band at that point. The rest of the group did not show up. Eddie Van Halen was rumored to be in rehab at that point. The 2007 class only had artists inducted into the performers category as no one apparently had met the criteria for any of the other categories. Don't know why that happened. In that performers category, the hall inducted the Ronettes, Patti Smith, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, R.E.M., and this next group. The group Van Halen changed the game in a few different ways. First, they were a California hair band before there was such a thing as a hair band. Second, their guitarist, Eddie Van Halen, during their heyday excited the music community like no other guitarist since Jimi Hendrix. Eddie is still considered one of the greatest guitarists of all time. The band itself has four different chapters to it. Chapter 1 started in California. Eddie and his brother, drummer Alex Van Halen, started a band in the mid-1960s called The Broken Crumbs. It was originally Eddie on drums and Alex on guitar, but Alex actually liked the drums more, so they switched instruments, changing guitar history forever. They got popular on the local front, changed their name to the Trojan Rubber Company, because why not? And then they broke up. In 1972, they formed another band and called it Genesis, even though there was another more famous band at the time called Genesis, but, you know, details, schmeetails. They eventually did, however, change their name to Mammoth before finally settling in on Van Halen, because why not use their last names? Mark Stone played bass guitar, but was soon replaced by a local guy who played in the band Snake named Michael Anthony. They were renting a sound system from a guy who they auditioned for lead singer, but who didn't pass the audition. Later, they just figured that it was much better if they let the guy sing because they wouldn't have to rent the sound system from him anymore, which would save them a bunch of money. That guy, as it turns out, was David Lee Roth. The band played gigs in the Los Angeles area and especially on the famed Sunset Strip in the rock clubs there. They first were noticed by Gene Simmons of the group Kiss, who tried to get them signed but was told that the band would never make it. Stupid executives. In 1977, they were finally signed to Warner Brothers Records after a couple of smart Warner Brothers executives went to see the band perform at the Starwood Club in Hollywood. From their debut self-titled album to their sixth album, 1984, the band solidified its spot in rock history. With the showmanship of Diamond David Lee Roth, the virtuosity of Eddie's guitar, Mike's pounding bass, and Alex's thundering drums, the band cranked out hits like Jump, Running with the Devil, Everybody Wants Some, Ice Cream Man, Panama, and many more. Their live performances became legendary. Their problems started around their third album, as Eddie wanted to move away from the good time songs and do more meaningful work. The group also started using more synthesizers, especially on the 1984 album. 
David went off and did Vegas-style music with a kitschy remake of California Girls and I Ain't Got Nobody with Just a Gigolo. Finally, things came to a full boil and David was out of the group. He went on to find his own guitar virtuoso in the legendary Mr. Steve Vai, and together they put out a couple of hit solo albums like Yankee Rose. And that was the end of the band. Or at least chapter one. Normally, a band losing a popular lead singer, especially of Diamond David Lee Roth's caliber, would kill a normal band. But the band had another chapter, when the Red Rocker Sammy Hagar came on board. That was after Daryl Hall of Hall & Oates and Patti Smythe of the band Scandal both turned down the lead singer spot. Although, really, could you see Daryl Hall actually doing it? Methinks not. Sammy already had a successful solo career going at the time with hits like I Can't Drive 55, Where Eagles Fly, and Three Lock Box. The band didn't miss a beat with Sammy, though. Sammy's first album with the band was the 1986 album 5150, which had huge hits like Why Can't This Be Love, Dreams, and Love Walks In. The group then followed that up with OU812 with the hits When It's Love and Finish What You Started. Their next album was For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge with the hits Pound Cake and Right Now. The 1995 album Balance finished off the Sammy Hagar chapter, but before then, all of the other Hagar albums were huge hits, winning awards and selling millions of records. Hagar abruptly left the group in 1996. Hagar would later say that Eddie's personal problems were a big reason as Eddie was continuously fighting alcoholism. David came back very briefly to record a couple of new tracks for a Greatest Hits album, and while there was talk at the time of a reunion, the infighting started all over again before anything else came of it, and that was that. Former lead singer for the band Extreme, named Gary Sharon, would enter the next chapter of the band, and together they put out the album Van Halen 3, which unfortunately crashed and burned. That era, part three of the chapter, lasted from 1996 to 1999. The band went on hiatus for a few years, but opened up a new chapter by bringing Sammy back for a reunion tour in 2003. That reunion, however, was short-lived, as Eddie's alcoholism had gotten way out of control, according to recent interviews that Sammy has given. Michael Anthony was abruptly fired in 2006 and replaced on bass by Eddie's son, Wolfgang. And at that point, guess who showed back up to open yet another chapter in the saga? Yep, Diamond David Lee Roth, who was back with the band until the very end in 2019 when they announced the breakup of the band. Unbeknownst to anyone at that point, Eddie was being treated for cancer and it had begun to take its toll, which was why the band stopped touring and broke up. In early 2020, a call was placed between Eddie and Sammy, where they mended their friendship. They dismissed doing any sort of announcement about it because the fans and the media would have then started rumors of another tour or discord with David, of which there really wasn't any. It was the fact that Eddie was, well, dying. Eddie's inner circle also knew that he didn't have much time to even consider another tour because they knew that his time was short, and they were right. On October 6, 2020, the untimely death of Eddie Van Halen occurred as he passed away from cancer. He was 65 years old at the time. When the band was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the only members who showed up to accept the award were the two members who got kicked out of the band at that point, that being Sammy Hagar and Michael Anthony, who started a band called Chicken Foot and then a new one called The Circle. Sammy has his own clubs called the Cabo Wabo Clubs, and he also has his own music interview show on Axis Television, which I highly recommend because he goes around and he interviews an awful lot of really cool people. After the demise of Van Halen, Wolfgang started his own band. They have at least put out one album so far. 
David and Alex are in retirement. Although David floated the idea of doing a reunion and or solo tour or a Las Vegas residency. But as of now, nothing has come to pass. Although David does have a podcast or a radio show of sorts where his trains of thought are typical Diamond Dave, which means that they kind of go around in circles and then derail. But at least it's fun. Presented for induction by the band Velvet Revolver, Eddie Van Halen, Alex Van Halen, Michael Anthony, David Lee Roth, and Sammy Hagar. Van Halen, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2007. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to look at the case for the New York City group Chic to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. First, a very brief explanation. When talking about the group, we're going to refer to their classic era of 1977 to 1983 when they had the original lineup of Nile Rodgers, Bernard Edwards, Tony Thompson, Norma Jean Wright, and Lucy Martin. The group is still going to this very day and is now called Nile Rodgers and Chic, but he is the only original member left as Norma Jean and Lucy left decades ago and Bernard and Tony both passed away. So, with all that said, as we usually do, to the tale of the tape we go. The classic lineup released seven studio albums and one compilation album. Of those, five hit the top 40 on the American charts, with three of those five going top 10, including 1978's C'est Chic getting to number one. Internationally, six hit the top 40, with only C'est Chic going top 10. In their heyday, they also released 15 singles. Of those, 14 hit the top 40 on the American charts, with 9 of those 14 hitting the top 10, including 5 hitting number 1, mainly on the dance charts. Internationally, 9 of the songs hit the top 40, with 6 of the 9 hitting the top 10. They had big hits like Dance, 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 Everybody Dance, Le Freak, I Want Your Love, and of course, Good Times. Good Times influenced so many bass players to pick up the instrument, including John Taylor of Duran Duran, and also influenced particular songs, like Queens' Another One Bites the Dust. Let us also not forget that it was ripped off slash sampled by the Sugar Hill Gang for the rap classic Rapper's Delight. While they were not true pioneers of disco, they did help to make it funky. Their influence extended not just to a generation of kids who wanted to play bass like Bernard did, but also to songwriters who wanted to write like those guys did and to combine genres to make their own brand. Now, Niall is already in the hall, having gotten in as a songwriter and producer on a lot of songs that you probably didn't remember he produced, like Madonna's Like a Virgin album, Sister Sledge's He's the Greatest Dancer and We Are Family, In Excess's Original Sin, Duran Duran's Notorious, Daft Punk's Get Lucky, and David Bowie's Let's Dance album. Sheik has actually been nominated 11 times for the hall since becoming eligible in 2002, but has yet to get in. Come to think of it, the only group to come from the disco era that's in the hall, as I know of at least, is the Bee Gees. There might be one other, but I think that's the only one. Perhaps the hall still has problems letting groups who are associated with the disco era in. They shouldn't. A lot of good music actually came from that era, Chic being chief among them. 
Sheik deserves to finally, after 11 tries at it, be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And to prove it, we are going to put their compilation album onto this week's podcast playlist. Also, it is in the show notes, and we're going to put in Van Halen's music onto that playlist as well, which I forgot to mention about the first go around. So there you go. There are many walks of fame in the world. There's, for instance, the Aerospace Walk of Honor in Lancaster, California, the Almeria Walk of Fame in Almeria, Spain, the Australian Film Walk of Fame in Sydney, Australia. However, when you think of walks of fame, you really only think of one, let's be honest. It's the most famous walk of fame of them all. It is the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The idea for the walk was dreamed up by E.M. Stewart, who was president of the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce in 1953. People think that the idea for having stars came from the Hollywood Hotel, which had stars on the ceiling of their dining room. The final parameters for the project were agreed upon in 1955 and presented to the Los Angeles City Council in 1956. Construction for the walk began in 1958 and ended in 1960. There were eight people who were supposed to be given stars first. Olive Borden, Ronald Coleman, Louise Frazenda, Preston Foster, Burt Lancaster, Edward Sedgwick, Ernest Torrance, and Joanne Woodward. However, director Stanley Kramer is credited with having his star installed on the actual Walk of Fame first on March 28, 1960. Popular myth is that Joanne Woodward was the first star because she was the first person to be photographed posing with her star, so that myth kind of stuck. The walk covers 1.3 miles down 15 blocks of Hollywood Boulevard with three blocks of Vine Street as space permits. As of August 29, 2024, there were 2,787 stars. The stars are awarded in five different categories, film, television, theater slash live performance, sort of a catch-all category, radio, and music. For our podcast, we will be dealing with artists who were awarded in at least the radio and music categories. People who get stars have to pay $50,000 for the upkeep to the star. Every year, the Chamber of Commerce gets over 200 names for consideration for a star, but only 20 to 24 stars have been awarded during a normal year. There has only been one star that has not actually been put on the sidewalk, Muhammad Ali's, because he did not want it to be walked on because he was a champion. He was inducted into the theater-slash-live performance category. And his star is on a wall at Hollywood and Highland at 6801 Hollywood Boulevard, to be precise. There have also been special stars given out to people who were part of the Hollywood community, such as former Los Angeles mayor, the late Tom Bradley, and honorary mayor of Hollywood and the guy most associated with promoting the Walk of Fame, the late great Johnny Grant. There have been stars given as well to people who were not entertainers, but had done important things, such as the crew of Apollo 11. Usually, those stars are put in the live performance category. That would be why it's a catch-all category. There have been two presidents who were given stars, Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. Reagan was given one for his radio and acting career and Trump because of his TV show, The Apprentice. Only one star so far in the history of the Walk of Fame has ever been considered for removal from the Walk of Fame. That would be Donald Trump's for a myriad of reasons at this point. As of yet, no final decision has been made about removing it. They're probably waiting to see who wins the election. Politics, you know. Marian Anderson was a famous 20th century classical music singer who was born on February 27, 1897 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She first got noticed in 1925 at the age of 28 when she won a singing competition that was sponsored by the New York Philharmonic. 
From there, she played throughout most of America, including a concert in 1928 at Carnegie Hall. In 1929, Anderson received a Rosenwald Fellowship to study in Berlin, Germany. And while in Europe, she met and became good friends with famed composer Jean Sibelius, who wrote a lot of compositions specifically for her. After that, her career took off, playing to packed houses throughout Europe and receiving praise from many famous people, including from conductor Arturo Toscanini, who told her that she had the voice, quote, heard once in a hundred years, end quote. Her reception in all parts of Europe and even Russia was such that they gave it the catchphrase Marian Fever. While she did come back to America to perform at least 70 concerts a year, and while her concerts were always sold out, her personal reception was much different. Why? Because Marian Anderson was black. While people loved to hear her sing, she wasn't allowed to eat in certain restaurants or stay at certain hotels, and not just in the South, since it's a common misconception that racism and Jim Crow laws were simply a Southern issue. Washington, D.C., despite being the nation's capital, was a segregated city until 1953. The same segregation laws that applied to the much maligned Southern states also applied to D.C. as well which tends to be forgotten about in history. That meant that black people couldn't eat in certain restaurants, drink from certain drinking fountains, swim in certain public swimming pools, or stay in certain hotels. That included Marion, who, no matter how good she was or how high her stature had become in privileged society, she still had issues. She did have people helping her out, though, One of her most famous friends was scientist and super genius, Mr. Albert Einstein, whom she stayed with whenever she performed in the New Jersey area, which also had a lot of unofficial, quote, segregation, end quote. This all came to a head in 1939. Famed concert hall, Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., was owned by the ultra-conservative group the Daughters of the American Revolution, who had a white performers-only policy. If you were black and wanted to see a concert there, you could, but you had to sit in the very back of the auditorium. Marian Anderson wanted to perform at Constitution Hall on April 9, 1939. Daughters of the American Revolution head, Miss Sarah Corbin Robert, said no, due to the whites-only performers policy. Marion tried to perform in other auditoriums in the city, but was declined everywhere. The final straw was when the D.C. Board of Education said that she could not use the auditorium of a school because the school was a whites-only school. Once word got out about Marion's troubles finding a place to play in Washington, D.C., it got people angry. A committee was set up called the Marion Anderson Citizens Committee, which consisted of various civil rights groups, including the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the American Federation of Labor. Protests were planned for the next Board of Education meeting. People resigned their memberships in the Daughters of the American Revolution, including First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Those resignations were criticized as being hypocritical because while Roosevelt and others put out press releases stating that the Daughters of the American Revolution was wrong about not allowing Anderson to perform, barely any of those same people criticized the D.C. Board of Education for doing the exact same thing as the Daughters of the American Revolution. Then, the press got involved and really churned up the water, writing on behalf of letting Marion perform, including her hometown paper, the Philadelphia Tribune, who wrote, quote, A group of tottering old ladies who don't know the difference between patriotism and putridism have compelled the gracious First Lady to apologize for their national rudeness, end quote. Finally, with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's help, a workaround to the situation was figured out. 
The National Mall in D.C. was federal land and thus was not subjected to D.C. segregation laws. The President and First Lady persuaded Secretary of the Interior Harold L. Ickes to let Marian Anderson give a concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And by persuaded, I mean they told him to do it or else. On Easter Sunday, April 9th, 1939, Marian Anderson performed in front of a racially integrated audience of more than 75,000 people. Millions more listened to her sing on the NBC radio network. Since no hotels allowed her to stay in D.C., and since apparently the President and First Lady didn't think it was cool for Marion to stay for a night at the White House, Marion stayed with her family in Philadelphia and took the two-hour train trip down to D.C. with her mother and sister. They did end up staying overnight in D.C. at a private house, but not the White House because, eh, who knows. Among the people who attended the concert were Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau, Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, and Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes, who introduced Marion. Then, accompanied by her piano accompanist, Kosti Vehenen, Marion started the concert with the song My Country Tis of Thee. She changed a line in the lyrics from Of Thee I Sing to Of Thee We Sing. Then she sang the aria, O Mio Fernando, then Schubert's Ave Maria, then the spirituals, Gospel Train, Trampin, and My Soul is Anchored in the Lord, and had an encore of the song, Nobody Knows the Troubles I've Seen. There were film cameras there, but they were only there to capture a couple of songs for the movie theater newsreels, so they never actually recorded the full concert. However, NBC Radio broadcasted the entire concert, and that recording was inducted into the National Recording Registry in 2008. As far as the rest of Marion's career went, she had a long, illustrious career and was celebrated as her generation's greatest opera singer, becoming a role model for future black opera singing legends such as Leontine Price and Jesse Norman. She received many awards, including a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, a Congressional Gold Medal, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom, among many others. She passed away on April 8, 1993, at the age of 96. As far as Washington, D.C. went, well, that was a little more complicated. The city finally was forced to get rid of its segregation laws in 1953, but it would take a couple of decades before things really changed, as places found different excuses to not serve black people. Marion was never allowed to perform in any facility that was controlled by the Board of Education. However, Marion finally did get to perform at Constitution Hall in 1943 as part of a benefit concert for the American Red Cross, as the nation was in the middle of World War II at that time. Located at 6250 Hollywood Boulevard, in front of Hollywood Burger, and about 50 yards down the street from the W Hotel, you will find the star of the legendary singer Marian Anderson on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood, California, and we have put some of her music onto this week's podcast playlist, as well as Van Halen and Sheik's, the link to which is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.